All right, hello, uh, class of 2020. So my name is Kathleen. Um, I graduated in 2011, so about nine years ago. And um, I'm so honored to be here today on this incredible day for you all. Um, I really hope I'm able to give the message justice over Zoom. Um, so yeah, uh, these are hard times. Um, I know this isn't the graduation any of you expected. I thought a lot about the message I wanted to deliver today. And in fact, I rewrote it a couple of times. I've listened to a number of commencement addresses in the past, but none of them really tell you how to face what the world is currently going through. That aside, I feel extremely lucky to be addressing an audience of women. Um, and more importantly than that, women I feel like I know. I know the teachers that played a part in raising you. Uh, they played a part in raising me. Um, and we share memories of the halls where you've spent much of your life so far. So in a, in a way, it kind of feels like we live parallel lives. Um, Personally, I've never really been the kind of person who can take advice. I'm more of the learn through my own mistakes kind of person. And I'm sure some of you are the same. So I'm not here to give advice. Um, and I'm also not gonna pretend like I have all or any of the answers. Um, instead, I just like to share my journey, what I've learned about what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a leader, and what it means to be both. Uh, that I think might help some of you during the next nine-ish years of your life. Um, after that, I don't know what happens. So you'll have to ask Mrs. McDonald or someone else about that. So I think that when I graduated, uh, this year's graduating class was the age that I was when I started attending Balmoral Hall. Um, so I thought we could travel back to my first day, uh, September 2002. My grade four teacher, Mrs. Young, who I will never forget. On the first day of school, she asked us to draw the map of Canada. And after 20 minutes, she asked us to hand in what we had. And I panicked um, as I was finishing up Baffin Island and labeling Iqaluit and, you know, uh, Newfoundland didn't look quite right. And um, most of the kids had drawn maple leaves and polar bears and others had drawn outlines with a dot labeled Winnipeg in the center. And I remember her flipping through them all and then getting to my map and looking kind of shocked and holding it up to the class and going, this is the map of Canada. And I remember my heart dropping. And in one split second, I lost pretty much all of my new girl cool factor. Um, and it got better. You know, later that fall, I sewed myself one of the ugliest hat and scarf combos you have ever seen. Like big, hairy, scruffy brown wool, holes in it pom-poms. <laughs> Bless my mother for literally never judging me because I was so proud that I wore it every single day and Mrs. Young told me she loved it so I made her a matching set for Christmas and then we both wore them every day. <laughs> um, I played on every sports team uh, but I was pretty much the worst player on every team. Um, I did every single musical even though I was uh, too shy to ever play any serious roles. My voice would just kind of like crack in the middle of my auditions. Um, but I do remember for the musical Cats, I was McCavity. And when the costume designer was uh, measuring me, uh, I think I might have been dancing around or something. And I remember him saying, Katie Eva, you really dance to the beat of your own drum, don't you? And I remember thinking, oh crap, I must need to practice my choreography a bit more. But I eventually realized that's not what he meant. Um, although that's also probably what he meant. <laughs> so needless to say, I was a bit of a geek um, and a little bit eccentric for sure. Um, but did I see myself as a leader? Um, honestly, no. And uh, not when I was elected school captain and not when I brought juice boxes to parties and not when I took every single advanced placement school or class the school had just because I was interested in them. And I've thought a lot about why, you know, I didn't see myself as a leader, but what is a leader anyway? Um, throughout history, they have been generals, kings, uh, presidents, and more recently, uh, founders and CEOs. 
ambitious, confident, decisive, powerful, strong, stoic risk takers, right? Uh, hold that thought. I'm going to steal a story from a memorable commencement address I read once. Uh, this is Water by David Foster Wallace. And my version goes like this. So two graduating Balmoral Hall fishies are swimming along and they pass a graduate from almost 10 years ago. Still cannot believe it has really been that long. Uh, and she looks at them and says, hey girls, how's the water? And the fishies keep swimming until one of them looks at the other and says, what is water? Now, people have different interpretations for what water is in this story, but the way I understood it is it's the stuff you don't notice that is sometimes invisible about your culture and your environment that shapes and changes the way you see yourself and the way you see the world. And this water is different for everyone, but for me, it went a bit like this. So I grew up with a stay-at-home mom and at BH, a lot of my friends did. Some of the people I respected the most in the world were brilliant, educated, career-oriented women who, who gave that up to raise a family. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. I feel so grateful for the childhood I had with my mother. Many of you will choose to have a career earlier on, but eventually dedicate your lives to raising a family. And this is a great choice, if it's the right choice for you. But I didn't really see it as a choice. You know, without even noticing, I think I tried to think about the kind of career I could have that also worked with having a family, which in retrospect felt a bit like trying to force a dancing donkey inside of a mitt. Um, although I was encouraged that women could be anything and that I should think about my career, at the same time, I couldn't ignore the messages I was receiving about the value of women and therefore myself in society. You know, Instagram feeds full of photoshopped women that all of us validate. Uh, the way we talk about how girls look, even as women, as if that should mean anything about who they are. Uh, you know, how women are told they're too emotional or too naive for business. I think the first time I was told that I was 12. Um, why do we raise women to be nice and follow the rules and tell boys the opposite isn't only okay, it's a good thing? What about finding a partner or getting married? Why is there so much pressure for women as if it somehow puts our value into question if we either choose to delay it or God forbid, don't choose it at all? And I grew up reading almanacs and science magazines, interested in pretty much everything, uh, building random businesses in the back of math class and my mom couldn't teach me matters for the life of her. And I mean, Ms. Wilkes's story of first meeting me and me walking in front of her teaching and knocking all over all of her books doesn't exactly scream polite. And that's because it wasn't polite. Like I wasn't polite. Um, so as much as I was already defying many of the norms for young girls, I didn't feel confident that I was meant to defy them completely. Um, and in the, and I'll put her quotes, uh, man's world I wanted to fit into. One of my characteristics didn't really belong. And that was my empathy. Um, it made me feel a lot of shame, as if it was somehow a weakness, as if caring about others would somehow hinder my success. But like, I cared a lot. Now I'm not afraid of it. And I know it is my biggest strength. But the thing I wish I knew then, and I want you to know now, is that there is no right way to be a woman. To many women I have met, finding our truest selves is not a question of ambition versus empathy, but finding a way to choose both. Um, and you know, I went through a rough patch after I graduated. I, I, I didn't really know who I was. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. It was hard to, to find motivation and, and I struggled with my mental health. But what I ended up discovering was my empathy is my ambition and it is what drives me to build organizations that solve real problems and remove the pain that people experience so the truth is we've got to find a way to redefine leadership uh, the characteristics we associate with leadership that i mentioned before ambition decisiveness power stoicism 
Researchers now recognize these mean less about leadership and more about the people who have held those positions so far in history, who most of the time just so happen to be men. So no wonder it was so hard for me to see myself as both a woman and a leader when I had qualities of both, and no wonder it's so hard for so many others. You know, Canada has still never had a formally elected female prime minister. And the reasons for this have nothing to do with the competence of women, as we can see clearly by looking at countries like New Zealand and Germany's fantastic responses to COVID-19. But instead, everything to do with the water that has shaped our understanding of women, our understanding of leadership, and our understanding of ourselves. You know, women shouldn't need to full fit the mold that has existed. Um, and we don't need to create space for more female kinds of leadership because female kinds of leadership are a little bit bogus. You know, that's just leadership. You don't need to be bossy. You don't need to be ambitious for ambition's sake. And I'm not saying you can't be. I can definitely be bossy. Just ask my little brother. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that if you aren't, that's okay. That's not what being a leader should be. It's not what being a leader should require. And it's not what the world needs more of. You don't need to be more like men. You just need to be more like yourself. And I know I'm 26. I don't know much. So take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt. Um, but if I had to redefine leadership, this is the way I would do it. Three things to being a leader that can include everyone from stay-at-home mothers to accountants to presidents. And they include some of the things I was starting to do when I was a little girl, sewing ugly hats and wearing them because I thought it was cool. Or what some of you might do wearing funky outfits on Muffy Days. <laughs> so number one, you've got to know yourself. Um, and I think this begins with values. One thing I'm very grateful for from my nine years at BH is that it definitely laid the foundation for the value system I would carry with me for the rest of my life teachers, the friendships, I can't say for certain, but I would bet many of you will end up feeling the same in the future. Uh, a few years after I graduated, I visited my grandfather where he lives in the mountains, and he grilled into me the importance of values, how they are intentional and personal, and he forced me to write mine down and reflect on them every morning for three weeks. Which seems like a bit much, but it really worked, and he promised me to carry them with me during every important decision that I make. For me, these are things like honesty, equality, hard work, treating others with dignity and respect. Values are different for everyone because they are part of who you are as an individual. And once you find yours, and you might have already, live by them. Write them down, share them, defend them ferociously. Um, do not let them slide for a romantic interest, for your parents, uh, or for any future bosses. And the world way undervalues values these days. Most schools don't teach them the way BH did. But after a few years of working in the real world, I don't believe there's anything more important. Another thing necessary for knowing yourself is experimentation. It's really hard to learn how to take risks or to even learn that you should. The world doesn't exactly reward this behavior. In fact, most of the time there are consequences for it. So taking risks is terrifying because we are afraid of failure. But I really want you all to flip that idea on its head. That's our water talking. Um, failure should be what you're all trying to do uh, because the sooner you fail, the sooner you learn and the faster you grow. And I've used this analogy with my friends a lot in the past, but I think people are a lot like startups and they require a lot of iteration. And what I mean by that is, um, and what I learned living in San Francisco, uh, building a, a company from scratch, is that some of the world's biggest companies, Uber, Airbnb, they all shared a similar path to success. Uh, rapid failure, rapid learning from the failures, and rapid responses and changes to their core products. Startups that do a lot of experimentation are much more likely to succeed. Um, and what I find funny is that we don't leave the same space for humans. Uh, we expect people to get things right on the first time, and we don't leave room for change or for forgiveness, and this is not only silly, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, the best startup founders have failed many, many times. The biggest companies are here today because of failure. Often VCs will only invest in founders who have failed many, many times. Um, so be patient 
experiment, take risks, fail. You'll not only be okay, you'll be better for it. And there is no right path to finding yourself or, or discovering your water. And I personally got very lost along the way. But what I can promise you is that any and every difficult, you experience, difficult experience you encounter, um, it's going to change you in a way you never expected. Your path won't look like mine, but what I'm telling you is that it shouldn't. No one's path will look the same, and you should never compare yourself to others. And remember that if you do find yourself and you realize you're a little bit different, that means you're doing it right. Uh, it's not only okay to be different. It's the first step to becoming a leader. Adam Grant, a famous psychologist from Wharton, who I love, says in his book, Originals, that there are two ways to find success. Uh, one is to compete in society and be better than everyone else at it. And this is actually super hard to do in a world with billions of super accomplished, really intelligent, amazing people. So in other words, be the world's best conformer. Um, but there's another way, and that's to be an original. And I think that's where the world's best leaders come from. Number two, um, so if the first step of being a leader is finding and knowing yourself, the next step is to be that person. And this is an incredibly difficult thing to do. It takes a lot of vulnerability and therefore a lot of courage. Uh, being authentic in your everyday lives, uh, living your values. You can have a beautiful heart and mind, but to be a leader means having the courage to show it to the world. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of Franny Brown, uh, but she's a researcher who has written several books on the topic of vulnerability. Uh, she has a cool TED talk and she's even on Netflix. Highly recommend, do some Googling. Um, and she says, vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. And when I reflect on little or me at Balmoral Hall, I start to realize how lucky I was to have the experiences I shared that allowed me to be comfortable as my real self. You know, the geeky kid who read almanacs and told jokes and wore holy hats that mas matched with the teachers, who brought juice boxes to parties and danced to the beat of her own drum. Um, at the time, they felt painful, but that's the point. That's where the strength comes from. Um, so to reiterate, one, find yourself. Two, be yourself. Uh, and finally, the last thing, um, change the water for others. And... I'll be honest, I'm still working on this last bit. I spent the last nine years working on the first two and I didn't even realize I was, you know? Uh, it's only in retrospect that I can, I can articulate them so clearly. Um, and I think I'll be working on this third for the rest of my life. Um, the world does a great job at making us feel like we aren't all connected, that we are somehow different because of things like the color of our skin, our religion, our privilege, and we hold, you know, people in technology in our hands um, uh, instead of our hearts. And politicians try to divide us and they do a really good job at it. But, you know, uh, I've learned that people are so much better than, than we think they are a lot of the time. Um, I read a lot and one of my favorite books of all time, highly recommend you all reading this, is Give and Take by Adam Grant, the same guy I mentioned before. Um, and the book starts off posing the reader a question. The world's least successful people, do you think they are givers or takers? Turns out, sadly, uh, they are givers. But here's the twist. What about the world's most successful people? Givers or takers? Turns out, they are also givers. And a big reason is because people who are motivated by helping others can find more energy than those motivated for other reasons. Um, you know, it's almost limitless energy. So if you don't see yourself as a leader because you have empathy, because you are giving, because you find your courage and strength in helping others, you are wrong. You are exactly the leader the world needs. You know, it's my belief that the unkindness we see in the world, it isn't that people are bad deep down. It's actually just that they haven't found the courage to discover themselves or the courage to be that person. And perhaps they fear their empathy the way that I did. But the world doesn't need more presidents who wanted to be president, or more CEOs who wanted to be CEOs, or more wealthy people who wanted to be wealthy. The world needs real good people. 
who want to solve the problems that are threatening the future of humanity, who recognize their privilege, and who use their gifts of empathy to change things for others. And I'm telling you this because I never grew up wanting to be a leader. I wanted to learn and have fun, but the more I learned about the world, the more I realized that there are too many people without a voice. And if you know who you are and you care and you have courage, the world needs you. Um, the world needs your empathy, your courage, your honesty, your kindness to be the CEOs, to be the prime ministers, to be the leaders in your everyday lives. You're intelligent, compassionate, courageous women, and that means a lot. More than your organic chemistry grades well, that's for sure. <laughs> um, and there are a lot of ways to change the water for others. But one is simply by being yourself, by being every kind of woman until there is no right kind of woman to be. And another is by standing up for what's right in the spaces where it feels most uncomfortable, on social media, for example. You can do this as a mother, you can do this as a doctor, you can do this as a student, you can do this as an engineer. And during the height of lockdown, I saw grocery clerks doing it daily. Um, there's something special about being a woman and a leader. You know, you're not going to be like anyone has been before. You'll find your strength in your compassion, your conviction in your genuine selves. And nine years from now, in my shoes today, I know you'll be the women who know themselves, who live their lives authentically and with tremendous courage and who are changing the water for others, for those who cannot change it for themselves. Um, leaders feel a sense of responsibility for themselves, for others and for the world. They live their lives authentically and therefore courageously. But most importantly, leaders are real people. You know, they're grocery store clerks, they're nurses, uh, they're the teachers that raised us. Um, they're every single one of you. So, to the Balmoral Hall costume designer who told me I danced to the beat of my own drum, I will respond 12 years later with this quote from Henry David Thoreau. If a man, and here I will insert, or a woman, uh, does not keep pace with his companions. Perhaps it is because they hear a different drummer. Let them step to the music they hear, however measured or far away. So now, graduates of 2020, it's your turn as women, but most importantly, as yourself, to discover the beat of your own drum, uh, to find the courage to dance to it, and to change the world. The water is waiting. Thank you.